Hello, goblins and ghouls, and welcome to my Haunted Life podcast. I'm your host, Angela Hartshorn, and on today's episode, we are going ghost hunting, looking for a famous lesbian weed activist spirit on Halloween weekend. Hello, my spooky babes. How are you all doing today? I hope it's great because you're great. Due to continued rain and threats of flooding, I've decided to stay in and work on finishing up the podcast instead of going to the shop. Um, for one, I apparently have some form of PTSD left over from the floods after the Wada Canyon fire. If you're from Colorado, you know what I'm talking about. So I basically panic anytime we have a flash flood warning now. It's great. Any friend that lives downstream from me got a text way too early this morning checking on them. To um, They can definitely attest that this is a thing. But at the same time, it also kind of feels like Seattle right now. So it's perfect to finish these all up together. It feels so weird to be taking a break. It's kind of like going on summer vacation, but I guess I kind of am in a weird way. I'm going to work really hard to get the old stuff posted and updated after the season ends. And again, I really, really want to get some of the videos together for the YouTube. Um, the thing is, I'm not 100% sure if they're going to be on YouTube. They might be TikTok videos. Most of them I filmed portrait style because I just filmed on my phone and didn't think about doing YouTube at the time. And when I post those on YouTube, a bunch of people yell at me about it. So we'll see. We'll see how I, I feel about it. At the very least, look for them on TikTok, I guess. So make sure to subscribe to everything My Haunted Life podcast so you don't miss anything. And don't miss out on the start of next season. I'll probably sprinkle in some surprises. Just little things here and there every once in a while. Especially over on the Patreon. So, you know, maybe some summer ghost stories. Oh my god, I just totally realized that um, last year for Pride, I did all queer ghost stories. And this is going to be coming out. I'm not exactly sure what the calendar date is, but we're getting close to Pride. And so that's kind of fun, because our ghost today is a very famous lesbian ghost. So that's kind of fun. But yeah. I can't believe this is the last episode of the season, though. It feels like it's been forever since I started this season, with random breaks in there due to shows and sicknesses and stuff. I feel like I started, it was supposed to be February, March, April. And so, yeah, I'm basically a month, almost two months behind. <laughs> but I guess it works. You know, whatever. Um, but yeah. We got, we got to the finale. Finally. And I'm really excited to share this one with you. On this week's episode, I'm taking you guys ghost hunting. I know, everybody likes the ghost hunting episodes. At the Soriento Hotel in Seattle. And this was recorded Halloween weekend. I believe it's the 30th of October. The Soriento is considered to be in the top 10, depending on the list, sometimes top 13 haunted hotels in the United States. And she did not disappoint. Oh my God. So let's get into it, shall we? Grab yourself a cup of tea. Make sure the doors are locked and the sage is close by. I have a story to tell you. The 
The Hotel Soriento is this gorgeous hotel in downtown Seattle. It's honestly kind of hard to describe. It's mostly a red-brown brick building with beige bricks sprinkled in in a pattern. I've never seen that done before, so I thought that was pretty unique. The front entrance has a sign over the top of the doorway, and it's kind of funny because it's this these big block letters that say the, and then it, on a filigree framed globe looking thing in a different font, it says hotel. And then in the same big block letters again, it reads Soriento. I feel like I do pretty good research when I'm looking for places to stay. Other than last week's episode, if you listen to that one. But I was not prepared for how gorgeous the interior of this hotel is. It's this mix of like really rich tones, like really rich chocolate browns and golds and burgundies. And there's marble, It's and it's dimly lit a little bit, especially in the evening when the Dunbar room starts going. It, and it's just immediately cozy. And our hotel rooms were so cool. They're, they were these little sweet rooms, and they weren't little, literally sweets. Like, I got video, you'll see. Anyways, when I made the reservation, I requested one of the haunted rooms. When I checked in, the guy behind the desk was so freaking sweet. I'm pretty sure I've said this on the Seattle episodes already. But that was the thing about Seattle over and over and over again. It was just how freaking nice and friendly people are out there. Like, extremely just blue southern hospitality out the window. Also, they're they're really into their ghosts out there. Was not prepared for that either. Anyways. When he was checking us in, I had to ask if by chance someone had seen my request for a haunted room. If if we didn't get one, I understand. It's fine. Things like that get missed. But was kind of wondering if we could explore a little bit. Respectfully, of course. We weren't going to be obnoxious. But just just if it didn't happen. He got this big ol' grin on his face. He said that the main haunted room is room 408, which had already been booked out for the weekend. But they made sure to put me on the quote-unquote spirited floor. Apparently most of the fourth floor is active, so that was really good to know. The Soriento Hotel, oh no, is the Hotel Soriento, I said backwards, is near the First Hill neighborhood in Seattle. The hotel opened back in 1909. This hotel was developed by Samuel Ro- Rosenberg, Rosenberg, a clothier in Seattle. Ever since its opening, the hotel would basically find itself in financial distress it was always a problem so i thought this was funny in 1910 rosenberg traded his hotel for a 240 acre pear orchard in the rogue river valley apparently pears were all the rage at the time so i guess i guess it made financial sense anyways in 1908 an illustration of the hotel appeared in the local paper um, by the architect of the hotel, Harlan Thomas, with the caption, This location was a family hotel and great for tourists. Harlan Thomas was the hotel and the Hotel Soriento helped shape Seattle. The hotel was the first to have a rooftop restaurant, which I guess I was technically there. It was also known for its beautiful arched windows and arched doorways. It also had wide eaves and a different hipped roof. I don't know what that means, but I kept seeing it on everything. 
Plus, pairing all of that with the traditional Italian red Renaissance aesthetic, it was a huge hit in Seattle. It was like this Italian Renaissance stuff in Seattle was freaking huge at the time. I, I've seen that all over the place in my research. It would be it would bring sophistication and allow for more residential accommodations for both visitors and locals, which really makes sense when you see how big the freaking rooms are. Apparently, at one time, you could also see the ocean, but now see, Seattle's growing up around it, and it's actually one of the shorter buildings now. Like, where we were, I think we're flanked on the hospital, by the hospital, but on almost two sides? I can't remember what was behind us. But out front, it was the... Anyways. Uh, Booking.com so eloquently put it, overlooking the downtown city skyline, the Soriento is a most unique upscale hotel offering an intimate setting as the longest running luxury hotel in Seattle and recognized as the quote-unquote Grand Dame of Seattle, the Soriento is defined by legendary hospitality, living up to its reputation as one of the finest hotel destinations in Seattle. But let's be honest, I could rave about how wonderful everybody is there and how gorgeous the hotel is, and it's, it's pretty. Although, I'm going to throw this out there, the elevator is terrifying. Just throwing that out there. But we are here for some ghost hunting. The resident ghost at the Soriento is said to be Alice P. Toklas. She is frequently seen wandering the halls around room 408. She is dressed in white or black. It is said that she has cursed the lights, and that causes them to flicker, which I thought was funny. It is even said that she has cursed drinks and causes them to move around when people are in the Dunbar room. The Dunbar room is this really classy lounge bar area they have in the hotel right by the lobby. It's really freaking cute. I'm curious, at this point, does anybody, like, know Alice Tolkis? Tok, Tok Lass? Um, I feel like this is a certain generation kind of thing. But I'm just, if you know, don't tell anybody around you, because we're, she's really fun. <laughs> don't ruin the surprise, man. Um, so we're going to bounce all over the place for uh, Alice's history here. And why? She's freaking famous. We aren't sure why Alice is haunting the hotel. It's kind of a weird thing. It is unlikely that she had ever walked the halls while she was alive. She was born in San Francisco in 1877 into a middle-class Polish Jewish family. Her paternal grandfather was a rabbi and whose son, Fivel usually known as Ferdinand, Alice's dad, Ferdinand Toklas, moved to San Francisco in 1863. In 1876, Ferdinand married Emma Levinsky, Levinsky, and they had two children, Alice and her brother, Clarence Ferdinand. In 1890, the Toklas family moved to Seattle where her father was one half of Toklas Singerman and Company, the company's leading dry goods store. Toklas was educated in local schools, which included the Mount Rainier Seminary and attended the University of Washington, where she studied piano. When her mother became ill, the family moved back to San Francisco. Her mother sadly died in 1897 at the age of 41. While in Seattle, it is believed that the family would reside close to where the hotel would be later built. However, they would return back to San Francisco 10 years before the hotel even opened. One source believed it was the very same block. 
so the the future hotel grounds were her stomping grounds in life and maybe she's more connected to the earth the the time around it than the hotel why she say picks room 408 to hang out with nobody knows it is I'm not even sure how they got to know that it was Alice it's just everybody knows it's Alice it's it's really weird <laughs> and she didn't even die in Seattle or even the United States she actually died in Paris after being ill for many years Whatever the reason is, she's haunting the Sorrento. She is such a very strong presence in the hotel. Every, like, like I said, nobody blinks an eye. It is Alice B. Tolfless at the Sorrento. I, I, I don't know. I love it, though. They're very adamant. Alice, for lack of a better term, was a bad bitch. Let's be honest. Total, total badass. She was a well-known member of the Parisian art community. She was also a lesbian, a well-out-there lesbian, very out. And at the time, that's insane to me. I, I think that's so cool. And she was the longtime partner of Gertrude Stein. And it's also said she is the one credited for inventing the pot brownie. Now, now I'm wondering if how many people are like, oh yeah, I remember that. So, obviously you don't remember her doing it, but learning about it. Anyways, five months after the devastating 1906 San Francisco earthquake, earthquake, okay, Toklas left the city and moved to Paris. On September 8th, 1907, the day after she arrived in Paris, she met Gertrude Stein. This marked the beginning of a relationship which lasted for nearly four decades, ending in 1946 with Stein's death. Together, they hosted a salon in the home they shared at 27 Rue de Fleur, Flores, that attracted expatriate American writers such as Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald, as well as avant-garde painters such as Picasso. Just all these famous people hanging out in their house, you know. Ugh, the salons in Paris. I bet it was so cool. Acting as Stein's confidant, lover, cook, secretary, muse, editor, critic, and general organizer, Tolkis remained a background... I'm just going to keep saying Alice. That makes more sense. That's easier. Remained a background figure, chiefly living in the shadow of Stein, until the publication by Stein of Alice's quote-unquote memoirs in 1933 under the teasing title The Autobiography of Alice B. Toklas. It became Stein's best-selling book. And from what I read about it, it's very fictitious, but now I really want to find it because I bet it's cute. W.G. Rogers wrote in his memoir of the couple, uh, published in 1946, that Toklas, Alice, I'm just going to say Alice, was a little stooped, somewhat retiring, and self emphasizing. She doesn't sit in a chair. She hides in it. She doesn't look at you, but up at you. She is always standing just half a step outside the circle. She gives the appearance, in sort, not of a drudge, but of a poor relation. Someone invited to the wedding, but not the wedding feast. James Merrill wrote that before meeting Alice, one knew about... The tiny stature, the sandals, the mustache, the eyes. But he had not anticipated the enchantment of her speaking voice, like a viola at dusk. And 
do did I save that article? Oh my god. So many of her artist friends were just like obsessed with her having this little mustache. And I I have a bunch of pictures I will be posting of her that I found. I don't see it. So I don't know why everybody's so, you know, obsessed with it. Probably, you know, womenly beauty standards. But I, I don't see it. It's not that big a deal. But there, I found this wonderful article talking about that. This is all about the freaking mustache. It's so weird. Anyways, Alice and Gertrude remained a couple until Gertrude's death in 1946. Although Gertrude willed much of her estate to Alice, including their shared art collection, some of it being Picasso's, Housed in their apartment at 5 Rue Christine, the couple's relationship had no legal recognition. As many of the paintings appreciated greatly in value, Stein's relatives took action to claim them, eventually removing them from Alice's residence and placing them in a bank vault while she was away on vacation. Alice then had to rely on contributions from friends as well as her writing to make a living. And this is why LGBTQ rights are very, very important. Alice's biggest claim to fame, however, was that she is credited with being the inventor of the pot brownie. I found this article from Scientific America about Alice and her brownies. I could not believe I found this on, in Scientific America. She published the Alice B. Toklas cookbook in 1954, following the death of her longtime partner. Along with personal musings, it contained recipes primarily for French cuisine, but it is the inclusion of the Moroccan cannabis confection that kind of got, got some notice. Its inclusion was a last minute addition to the book. With her book's deadline mere months away and having space to fill, Alice decided to get the help, to get by with a little help from her friends. She asked those from within her social circle to contribute some of their own recipes. Unbeknownst to Alice, writer and avant-garde artist Byron Gilson, I'm, I'm not familiar with this guy, his contribution was also a way to get high with a little help of for her friends. I can't believe like there were so many like reference, song references in the Scientific America article. I had so much fun with this. Apparently, Tokus Alice was unaware of what cannabis was, and it's spelled wrong. It's spelled C-A-N-I-B-U-S, and had no time to test the recipes her friend submitted, so she sent it to her publisher, oblivious to any controversy it might cause. In an interview on Pacifica Radio, in 1963, Alice recalled its inclusion as innocuous. The recipe was innocently included without my realizing that the hashes was an accented part of the recipe, she said. She added, I was shocked to find that America wouldn't accept it because it was too dangerous. In the early 1960s, a second edition was published in the United States containing the hash-ish, it's hard to say, fudge recipe. It was embraced by hippie culture and referenced in the 1968 film, I Love You, Alice B. Tolkis. <laughs> in it, Peter Sellers, who is probably the most famous for being in the original Pink Panther movies. Like the 1960s ones, remember. 
Anyways, his character goes from straight laced to pot laced. Oh, somebody had fun writing this article. When he is seduced by a hippie and her hash brownies. Apparently, there is even a 1969 Bewitched episode entitled Tabitha's Weekend that references Alice. When Tabitha, who uh, is Samantha's daughter, I couldn't remember who Tabitha was, I had to look it up, asked if Andorra could have a cookie, Andorra asked Phyllis Stevens, they wouldn't by chance be from Alice B. Tulkis's recipe. I sadly couldn't find a clip of this. I found lots of clips of that episode. I could not find one directly. So if anybody finds it, please tag me in it. Also, the Scientific America article contains the original recipe in case you want to do your own research. The link will be in the show notes. A second cookbook followed in 1958, Aromas and Flavors of Past and Present. However, Alice did not approve of this one as it was heavily annotated. She also wrote articles for several magazines and newspapers, including the New Republic and the New York Times. In 18, nope, in 1963, she published her autobiography, What is Remembered, which ends abruptly with the death of Gertrude Stein. She died in poverty at the age of 89 and is buried next to Stein in Pierre Lancet's, Lancet's, I know how to say that, I can't say it right now, Cemetery, Paris, France. Her name is engraved on the back of Stein's headstone. The Hotel Sorrento is quite fond of having Alice hanging around. Why ever she's hanging around? They had hosted a dinner in 2018 that was in her honor. They have also used recipes from her cookbook. When we were there, the Dunbar Room had a drink named after her. She is said to make her presence well known. It's kind of interesting to me reading all the descriptions and everything of her character in life. She was you know, kind of shy, kind of, kind of quiet, it sounds like. It doesn't sound like she's that in the afterlife. It is said that you could hear a piano playing in the penthouse suite often, even if the room is not booked. She will often flicker lights and move drinks. A shoe, shoe chef at the Sorrento heard a piano playing inside the penthouse seat suite even though there weren't any go- guests there on the fourth floor guests have reported a presence outside of room 408 employees also had a strange encounter inside they heard this and quoting they heard this breath come out and they looked at each other and thought they were walking in on someone but when they peeked in there, there was nobody in there. An apparition has been spotted on camera by staff working overnight. They'll look up to see a ghost at the front desk, or see, to see if a guest is at the front desk, and that, and on that camera, they'll see kind of a blur going by the front desk. One night when we were getting drinks at the in the Dunbar room I had to ask our bartender about the hauntings he had some fun stuff to tell us always always go with the local information man apparently another shoe chef was in the walk-in freezer I think closing up for the night he had a heart attack and died it wasn't discovered for four hours until opening staff came in. They think he still lingers in the area. He also told us there's a little boy that causes mischief on Wednesday mornings for opening staff. And apparently, 
just on Wednesdays. He likes to move candles or any of the um, table places, the, the table decorations around. Apparently, a guy that checked into room 408 one night had gone up to his room and found a woman in it. He went back down very upset that there had been a mix-up with the rooms and even went up to the room with a desk clerk to find no one in the room. The staff believes he walked in on Alice. And probably my favorite story that he told us was a paranormal investigator booked out room 408 for Halloween three years in advance to investigate Alice. This sounds like something I would do. Not this part. He was only there for 30 minutes. The staff wasn't sure what to do, really. Apparently, he got in there, he set up, and then he just took off. He was done. He, he was not having it. The poor staff, they were like, I don't know what to do. He's only been in there for 30 minutes. So they weren't sure whether to charge him or not. But since he technically was there, he rented the room and they couldn't really rent it back out at that point, they decided to charge him. The bartender and the hostess were super nice and very talkative for how busy they were. I was, I could not believe how much time they actually stopped and talked to us with a crowd, full, full bar. It was, I thought it was cool. They didn't have to. We kept telling them, you guys don't have to talk to us. And they did anyways. The hotel was throwing a Halloween party that weekend with one of the local radio stations up in the penthouse suite. Since we already had plans that evening, that was when we went to the Merchant Cafe and we did a ghost tour of downtown Seattle. They said that if we wanted to, we could come up in the evening after we got back. So, we did. I haven't been invited to a Halloween party in a very long time. It was awesome. And it was such a cute little party. We we came in toward the end, but still. I'll definitely post pictures and videos. The next day we were leaving, so I knew that I had to get some ghost hunting done that morning. After going to bed after the Halloween party. I got up around 3 a.m., and for me, this was like, I was awake. I, I, I was so excited. It's like Christmas for me. I was so excited to try to get some ghost hunting in. In a famous freaking hotel on Halloween weekend. It was amazing. So I tried. I got up at 3 a.m. and tried to talk to Alice for a while. Unfortunately, there was a lot of commotion still down on the street. So I kept getting delayed. And by a commotion, I mean random fist fights. <laughs> Every time, I'm like, okay, I'll wait for these guys to go. And it would take them a while. And then they'd come back, and then they would leave, and then another group would show up and argue over who was driving. And it was always, it, there was like three freaking fist fights by different groups. It was insane. So... That was my morning. I kept waiting and waiting. And like sometimes I would try to go back to bed and wait for all the noises to go by. So many. Se it was so weird because like the entire trip beforehand, I didn't sleep that well because there were so many like police sirens. And like I said, we were next to the hospital. So that probably contributed a lot. But Halloween night with all these fist fights are happening, not one siren. I thought that was interesting. Anyways, um, you can definitely hear how tired I am by the time I actually get to start. I don't think I got to start until about 7 a.m. I, I, was, I was not the happiest. Yes, I know going into the sleepy is not the best for paranormal investigation. But I quickly woke up. 
I'm going to play for you the raw audio recording. I also filmed the whole thing to have like numerous different things. So I'll post that as well. I'm going to tell you now, it was strange. I was not prepared. One of the things they say is sometimes you hear a woman's voice in the hallways. And you go and look and there's no woman. It was kind of weird because we had that happen multiple times. I didn't get up and check every time to make sure there was nobody in the hallway. But there were a few times I'm like, I looked and there was nobody there. Did I get any of that on recording? No, that was just previous. Like there was one time me and Jordan are trying to figure out like where to go eat. And you could hear a woman laugh like right outside the door. And I immediately was like, oh my God, and went and looked and there was nobody there. And my husband being my husband's like, they, the amount of time it took you to walk from this point to this point, they're probably around the corner. That's why I keep him around. He's very skeptical. Anyways. Um, but yeah. I, with all that going on, I was very excited to get in to actual recordings and stuff. And yeah, it was strange. I was not prepared. I swore I kept hearing party noises and a lady's voice through the ghost box while investigating. And it comes and goes at different times. Um, it, uh, and sometimes I'm like, am I just listening to static too long? And I'm starting to matrix patterns and stuff. So I don't know. I definitely, definitely would like your guys' opinion on it. You have to let me know if you hear anything. I'm also going to post the raw audio with timestamps of when I hear things on the Patreon so you can listen to exactly what I'm talking about. One quick warning though. The ghost I was communicating with loved messing with the incredibly loud beeping squawking noise that is the ghost box's temperature gauge. There's a few times I had the audio up way too loud trying to hear if these were party noises or not. And then all of a sudden, bam, this thing comes in and it is so painful. So please be careful <laughs> about that. It sucks. Um, but yeah. And without further ado... Here is my inv investigation of the Sorrento Hotel with special guest star Alex B. Toklas. Okay, got that going. Um, I don't remember hitting the button on the video to go, but cool. Um, so, good morning, everyone. It is, what is it, October 30th. We are in the Hotel Sorrento. I believe it's about 7 a.m. now. I've been up and down the last, like, three hours uh, trying to do this uh, a small little boat ghost investigation and there's been like three fist fights in our parking lot below our hotel. Thank God we're on the fourth floor. So that's kind of cool because I get to watch from a safe distance. It Seattle is a very, very strange place. Very strange. Um... Hopefully, I think it's finally gotten quiet. Um, we can actually do this. So I'm going a bit old school and a bit new school at the same time. I have my 
pendulum. And we have the ghost box. I brought these with us because they fit well in my suitcase. And yeah, that's what I got. Um, so yeah, we're, I wish it was a, a little bit earlier because I was going to go wander the hallways, but then I realized it's probably not the best idea here. Not that our hotel's not very nice. I, I want that to be stated real quick because our hotel is very nice and all the staff has been amazing. So, make sure everything's going. Yep, we're still going. Let me get the ghost box up. Hopefully we don't wake up Jordan doing this. We might. Who knows? Jordan. So that's the temperature gauge going off. It usually doesn't go off first thing. So that's kind of interesting. Interesting. Okay, trying it back on. Okay. So the resident ghost is Alice. So I'm going to be talking to him as well. Um, Alice. Hello. I know you're traditionally down in room 408, but the staff can let me know that you like to wander the halls a bit. So I have this lovely ghost box here. I can usually hear your voice if you want to speak. Um, the other option is a pendulum here. I'm going to ask yes or no questions and you spin the pendulum clockwise for yes. This is so weird, so I don't like this. Um, and then spin the pendulum counterclockwise for no. I also have this recorder who's recording the ghost box. I have video. We got all of it. Okay. Alice, are you here? Do you like Halloween weekend? Yeah. 
thank you. Wow, I'm just, I'm very impressed already, sorry. Um, but you keep setting this off and I desperately want to go back to hear your voice. Um, are you happy here? I know this used to be kind of your stomping ground before the hotel came in. That is a clockwise pendulum movement. I just realized I have not mentioned that. All of them have been positive movements. And according to this, the temperature gauge is almost at the highest since I've been sitting here. And it's only been about eight minutes. I'm like, I wonder if I can listen to this recording. That was weird. Uh, I happened to look over at the um, video recording. And you know it has those little things where it like catches your face and something? This caught. I'm trying to see if I can't do it again. Uh, this caught something standing behind me. I don't know if the little face indicator is on the, uh, video, but that's very interesting. Like, I have chills, but I'm also in the bill hunting, so, um, our room is a very warm, it's like a greenhouse in here. And I could be just cooking myself, so I don't know if it's an actual cold spot, although... But I am breaking out in goosebumps. I could! I could just be spooking myself. That's a thing. Oh, that was one thing I wanted to look up. I hope it keeps recording. Oh, good, it does. Um, I know. Professional. Alright, that's what I thought. So, Alice, I, sorry, I should ask first, Alice, was that you standing behind me by the desk? guys like instant responses to everything um pendulum rotating clockwise wow um so alice i read that you are were are uh, a big weed activist back in your day and that's kind of amazing are you happy that recreational weed is legal in Washington? Wow. Probably the most definite, uh, pendulum answer, clockwise. Um, I 
the temperature gauge on the ghost box is doing something I've never seen it do before. <laughs> it's all the way at the height. And now it's just blinking. I've never seen it do that. Is it true, Alice, you're the one that came up with the idea of weed brownies? Pendulum is most definitely saying yes. Okay, I don't know what the ghost box is doing, so when that happens, we just do a hard reset. Okay. Alice, I'm going to turn this back on. You can go ahead and affect the temperature from the beginning again if you would like. You are more than welcome to speak again if you are interested in that. I just got this very quiet kind of chill. Um Alice, are you still here? If you are still here, Alice, I wanted to ask you, are you the one that plays piano upstairs? So, immediate chills, uh, pendulum is more so than Even the weed question. What is that? Alice, if that was you knocking, let's do it again. So I'm not 100% sure the, the weird thing with ghost boxes is sometimes you can pick up on music elsewhere on the radio. Um, I thought I just heard piano. Um, the closest piano is on the seventh floor. We are on the floor. So, I don't know what that was about necessarily. Was that you?
That was really strange, Alice. Um, did you just turn up the volume on the ghost box? Uh, it's doing the flashy lights again um, for the temperature. I don't know why it's not beeping every time. Um, I have had ghosts turn off the ghost box before or break it. Um, we don't know what happened to it, honestly. Never had one uh, turn up the volume a little bit. That was interesting. I never heard any knocking, so I'm assuming it's just creepy, creepy old hotel something. Um, Do you like being here at the Sorrento? Clockwise pendulum. I'm very sorry to hear that. But it's been over several sleeps. I have no idea what that was about.
uh, the bartender downstairs told us a story of a paranormal investigator in your room that you scared off. After only 30 minutes. Could you, if you have the ability and are willing, be willing to move something in the room here? What did you guys think? What did you guys hear? Please, seriously, let me know. Write me on any of the socials, email, anything. Please, 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 please. And it's weird to say it, man, but that's a wrap for this season. I'll be back very soon with all new episodes. At least it'll give me a chance to get you caught up. So yeah, thank thank you to everyone out there listening today, today, tomorrow, whenever you listen. Thank you. I really appreciate it. My Haunted Life podcast is written, researched, produced, edited, and hosted by me, Angela Hartshort. And let me tell you, it's not the easiest, but it's definitely a labor of love, but I definitely love doing this. So I really love it when you guys interact with me about it. If you're interested in more of the pictures, definitely check out the Patreon. That's where the actual video of the investigation will be. Um, You can support the show for as little as $2 a month. I really always appreciate that. That There's a few of you out there that actually support the show. And I really, I love you guys. If you have 
more information about today's episode you want to tell me or you know a ghost story to share and email me at my haunted life podcast at gmail.com like i said all the socials i'm there music is by ghost stories incorporated and that's it for this episode and this season and I don't know if I'm prepared to take a break, you guys. I'm going to miss you. It's going to be weird. I'll definitely see you after the break on my Haunted Life podcast. And until then, stay spooky. I'll miss you. But see you soon. <laughs>